A life in words, writes Roy McGregor, has been the greatest adventure I could hope for and more. Hailed as one of Canada's most gifted storytellers, the 75-year-old is the author of more than 50 books on a variety of subjects, all linked by their innate Canadianness. Now in his latest work, he's turning the focus on himself. Here to talk about paper trails from the backwoods to the front page, a life in stories is Roy McGregor. Welcome, Roy. Thank you, John. Uh, first off, congratulations on uh, paper trails. What made you want to look back now? I think you said it when you said that I was 75. I think that, uh, you know, I have basically took retirement, needed a project, started thinking about putting some of those stories together, and it eventually evolved into a, a memoir. So, yeah, it was fun. Well, it was, wasn't fun. It was kind of disturbing at times because I, I began it before my wife became ill. And so I end up having to write a final chapter about Ellen's passing, and that was really tough. The cover shot is uh, one of you in your canoe, uh, mid-paddle, looking off into the distance. Uh, a suitable visual metaphor, I think, for a, a life spent exploring and writing about those explorations. Is that fair to say? Oh, I think so. And of course, my hobby from childhood on has been canoeing. So anytime I wanted to get away, I would go into the great rivers and lakes of this country and, and explore. Now, one of the great stories you tell in the book was about your first assignment at McLean's and an honest mistake that uh, nearly ended your career there uh, before it began. Uh, what happened exactly? Well, I Peter Newman gave me an opportunity to write a, a column there, and he suggested do something about modern Canadian pop music and what state it was in. I was doing... At university, I was reviewing records and the like, even though I'm tone deaf. And so, but you got free records, you know what that game's about. And so I did this uh, column up saying, you know, all kinds of smart ass things like, uh, uh, not since, uh, not since the Who released the rock opera Tommy has there been a surge of creativity in any music, let alone Canadian music. Well, this went down the line and it came to the, uh, uh, copy editor, final copy editor, Joan. She's a Brit. Uh, she's quite a bit older, not into pop music at all. And down below, I had mentioned as well, you know, there still are some Canadian groups around doing pretty good work. And I mentioned the Guess Who. She presumed, therefore, that I had neglected to put that one key word in up at the top. So the opening paragraph says, not since the Guess Who released <laughs> the epic rock opera, Tommy. And of course, it went out and the screaming fans and angry people were right in. Newman hauls me into his office, has it circled in red ink, points it out to me, and that's the end of my career, I know. But I, how could I have made that mistake? I went down. I remember we used to work with carbon paper? I pulled the carbon paper copies out, and I went through it, and finally I saw, no, I hadn't made that mistake. Took the carbon paper back, went down through the line. We finally found out what had happened, but it sure was a close call. Now, uh, there's a phrase that comes up again and again in the book, so much so that it could have been an alternate title for the book. Uh, so tell me about McGregor Luck. <laughs> well, uh, an editor applied that to me. I, I always had this sense that, especially during an election, John, I would head off and they would just tell me to go out and take the pulse of the country. So I'd say, take a flight into Winnipeg, take a flight to Vancouver, I'd rent a car. And I knew the moment, I felt honestly, the moment that I pulled out of the, the rent-a-car drive, that I would run into a column before that day was out. And I would file a column every single day. I never, ever missed. And you could always just find interesting people. And I, and I came, even before the uh, Keith Spicer Commission looking into you know ordinary Canadians and that, I was more interested in the ordinary people than I was in the let's say the serious politicians who might be prime minister or premier at the time, I wanted to know what the people said and thought. So I really enjoyed that. And I was lucky. I kept running into interesting people. Now, uh, you write about getting to know uh, prime ministers over the years, three in particular, uh, Jean Chrétien, Stephen Harper, and uh, Justin Trudeau. Perhaps most interesting of them all is the time you helped uh, Mr. Harper uh, with his book about uh, hockey. What was he like to work with? Well, I thought he hated me when he first met me. And then uh, I was approached by his agent to see if I could help him polish this book that he had underway. And he was doing a lot of really serious hard work and he was getting somewhere, but it needed, first of all, I told him you need to have a, 
a narrative, which for people who write, that's the arc of the story. But then I came to realize, that because he, every time I used that word, he seemed to flinch. And then I came to realize that narrative on Parliament Hill and probably in all politics in Canada has taken on a, a twisted sense. It's It means either my lie or your lie. And so eventually we got to work together and we started working together quite well. And one time he invited my wife, Ellen, and I up to Harrington Lake, the summer place. <laughs> and we were up there and we were talking without using the word narrative. I said, I finally think I see the way that you can hinge this book together by having a character called John Ross carry it through. And he was so adamantly against professional hockey. The, the setting is around 1950, 1916, the early Leafs, so to speak. They weren't called the Leafs or anything. But there was a debate about whether they should be pro hockey. And he said, John Ross Robertson, ah, I do have an old book somewhere. Let's, let's go get the book. Before I know it, it got four suburban blacks uh sedans lined up mounties in each of them and my wife and i are in a 10 year old dilapidated ford trying to and he says just follow us and they go down meets lake and they're going fast and gravel spilling and then we get out on a number five highway and honest to god john they go into tactical maneuvers so they keep going shifting and they're dancing down there shifting each time to prevent assassinations i presume I said, Ellen, what are, what are we going to do? Well, just keep up. Don't even think about it. Just keep up. So we're doing these maneuvers. The same with them. Finally, we get to 24 Sussex. And somebody else had pulled in behind me in a Jeep, and he was right up my butt. And I thought, this guy is so mad at me because I did cut him off. I found out that he, he came right into 24 Sussex with us. He gets out, and he's a Mountie, too. He had been strategically placed to join the, the convoy at a certain point. <laughs> And then another time, if I may add, may add one more thing, we're working late at night, and I'm on my phone here. He's on his phone in his office at 24 Sussex, and there's a phone ringing in the background. And he keeps, I tell him, he's just distracted. And finally, he says, I have to take this. So he goes and takes it, and I hear mumble, 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 mumble. And then finally, I hear a sharp click. And he comes back, and I say, what was that? He said, that's the phone. What do you mean, the phone? The phone, you know, the one that connects the Prime Minister to the President, to the Prime Minister of Great Britain. It's the phone. Oh, my God. So we get back to working. He said, <laughs> he said everything would be, be fine. It was nothing. So we're back working. The phone starts ringing again. And finally, he says, I have to answer. And I think, oh, my God, has the nuclear war begun? Is there an attack underway? I hear mumble, 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 click. He comes back and he says, he didn't believe me that it was the wrong number. <laughs> the guy dialed him again. <laughs> now you've uh, you 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 touched on the Spicer Commission earlier, and of course you've you've written quite a bit about national unity over the years. Uh, as you write, uh, "Riled Canadians act." We are a country that so often seems much better at kicking someone out than putting someone in. Are we approaching uh, another one of those moments now? Oh yes, yeah, very distinctly. I think a lot of people forget that we kicked out Pierre Trudeau in 1979, and then suddenly Joe Clark, because he blew it, he, he had, Trudeau comes back, even though he'd said he, he was gone. And uh, this time, it's about the same, almost the same time spans, not quite, it was longer for Pierre Trudeau, but uh, people are tired of Justin, tired of the photo ops, and tired of, tired of his government. And it's just a Canadian thing that more often during history, we have kicked people out of office rather than put them in. And sometimes it has very weird and unexpected repercussions, such as when they got so sick of uh, David Peterson here in Ontario and kicked him out, only to discover that Bob Ray's NDP government was now head heading things up and Bob Ray was the premier. Now, the book reads like a trip back through time to the to the heyday of Canadian journalism, uh, expense accounts, lovingly written long form features, uh, assignments covering the the length and breadth of the country. Um, do you feel lucky to have worked when you did? No, are you kidding? Expense accounts, just one one phrase. Uh, we would think nothing of of doing the most bizarre things. For example, twice in my career, I rented helicopters without any permission. I just did. I once uh, Jeffrey Simpson and I rented a, a plane so we could fly over the oil sands. I, and because we were both up there doing stories on them, never asked. And I told I wrapped one story around. Uh, I almost lost a brand new skidoo up in the far north 
when I sunk it in a river, but to thank God, I was with a bunch of Inuit hunters and trappers and knew how to save the thing and salvage the thing. They hauled it out in time, but uh, I would have had to expense that. And we went everywhere, you know. You fall, now, as you know, in your business, a lot of people, a lot of uh, stations are no longer sending their play-by-play -play and color people on the road. They're having them watch it on the game on TV, just like the people back home, and then comment from a studio somewhere. I'm sorry. That's not right. That's not journalism. That's not getting a feel for what's happening. It's not getting the undercurrents, not getting the gossip. It's just sad. Why does journalism still matter? Matters more than ever. And, uh, you know, we're, we've, we've, ever since uh, <laughs> Trudeau's, or I'm sorry, Trump's assistant, Kellyanne, you know, with that uh, phrase, we have alternate facts when they were arguing about how many people had turned out to the uh, to see the inauguration. And uh, ever since then, it's been disinformation battling information. And sometimes disinformation is absolutely winning. And we've seen with the convoy and with the vaccination arguments and that, that it can get quite heated. And there can be a lot of disinformation out there, probably from both sides. And so I, I feel that it matters more than ever. And what I've decided to do, rather than whine and complain about digital and the fading newspapers, I mean, I'm sitting in a town here in Ottawa where the newspaper has all but vanished. But let's accept that it's going to be digital from now on, and let's have some really special places that do quality work. You know, a digital version of, say, the New York Times or the Globe and Mail. Truth matters. It matters more than ever. What do you hope people take away from the book? Partly that it's the greatest country in the world to have grown up in. It was, in my case, the greatest time to grow up in this country. And also that people are much better, I think, than we sometimes give them credit for. They're kind. They're decent. We sometimes get mixed up and angry at people, more angry than we should. I think politicians are certainly feeling that heat, particularly women politicians. I think we need to Take a pill and calm down. Sage Advice. The name of the book is Paper Trails from the Backwoods to the Front Page, A Life and Stories. It's available from Random House Canada. My thanks to Roy McGregor. Thank you, John. Thank you so much.